and try to explain to us all that Jesus went through for us on the cross. This morning I'm going to preach about the cup that he drank. Luke chapter 22, we have this account in God's word. To the east, we had a good Sunday school brother turned it down. We good? Let's not fight that. All right. I'll get louder. To the east of the city of Jerusalem, there is called a mountain called the Mount of Olives. It's about 300 feet above the city, just above the city. It's a limestone ridge and about one mile long. It's 2,700 feet above sea level. On the western slope of that ridge, there's a garden. And in that garden, in that garden, there are olive trees there. It's a place where Jesus often came to pray, as we will see in our text this morning. It is called Gethsemane. The word Gethsemane, if you know what it means, the word Gethsemane means oil press. It was a place where olives are pressed and put under extreme pressure to get the oil out of the olive. I cannot help but think that it had a greater meaning because there was someone, the someone named Jesus Christ, who would be under greater pressure in that same exact place. Jesus, again, had come to this place called the Garden of Gethsemane many times. But this night that we will preach about today is unlike any other night that he had ever been there. Jesus had been up on Mount Zion, and there in an upper room, he had what we call the Last Supper with his disciples. He spoke at that place of his betrayal. He spoke of crucifixion. And then Judas would leave that place and go and do just that and carry out that heinous crime of betrayal. To the Lord. Jesus needing a place to pray. Went to where he went often to pray. And that is the garden of Gethsemane. On his way to that place. Leaving Mount Zion. And going to the Mount of Olives. He would place. He would cross a brook. The brook called Cedron or Kidron. Was a little brook that he would cross. Very interesting that. Bible scholars tell us that during this time, and you understand there's no accidents in our Bibles. Sure. You understand that when they were crucifying Passover lambs, the Lamb of God, as John the Baptist called him, would be crucified on the same day that they would crucify the other lambs. The same time that they were examining lambs to see if they were spotless and worthy, Jesus would go through great interrogation to finally where even his enemies would say, I find no fault in him. Right. He's the spotless Amen. lamb. That's why in your Bibles, the Bible slows down the last week of his life. Yeah. Because there's an investigation, there's an interrogation. And again, even his enemies say, I find no fault in him. But as they were crucifying these lambs, Bible scholars tell us that this brook, this little stream called Kidron, would be filled with blood. Blood would flow down the Kidron <coughs> brook. And I have in my mind's eye as Jesus crossed that brook that night to go to the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives, that he would have seen that blood flowing and know that just in a few days or just really in a few hours, his own blood would be flowing in that same spot where they sacrificed the Passover lambs. Jesus comes to this place in the garden, and we find something very interesting here. 
We find him asking the Father, Lord, if it be possible, please, please let this cup pass from me. Lord, if there's any other way that I don't have to drink this cup, please, Lord, please, Father. I want to tell you this morning, we are not talking about a literal cup. Jesus is using a metaphor here. He's using a figure of speech. He's using a symbol and meaning, get a hold of this, meaning that he is going to experience something fully. He's going to drink all of it. It means to take something into one's most inner being. Like somebody taking a cup and putting it to their lips and putting it in their inner being. This is a cup of agony. As we will preach about this morning. That he drank on dark Gethsemane. And by the way, get a hold of this please. He did it there alone. It's interesting when Jesus began his earthly ministry. Performing miracles. Feeding multitudes, opening blinded eyes, healing withered limbs. Boy, the crowd, big crowds. Couldn't find a seat in the house. But then Jesus began preaching and teaching about discipleship. Who really wants to follow me? And when he began to preach about discipleship and who's interested in lordship around here? And a lot of people that way. They want salvation. They don't want lordship. Amen. Jesus began preaching that message, friend. They began leaving him in droves. Yeah. By the way, it got so bad. Jesus looked at his 12 disciples and said, you also go away? From those multitudes, now he only has 12. <laughs> I'm a for a church split. And now all those 12, one has left him. Judas has gone to betray him. And now he's got 11. Of those 11, he chooses three. And those three failed him and fell asleep. Now he goes to Gethsemane and he's not. And the only, you know who's there? Him and the father. And it wouldn't be long when his father would turn his back on him. And Jesus will say on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus is going to drink this cup alone. Luke 22, if you would look at verse 39. The Bible says, and he came out and went as he was wont. You see that there in verse 39, as he was wont. That means this is a place that he often came to. By the way, when Judas came to betray him, he knew where to find him. This is not Jesus' first time, and Judas knew where he could find the Lord. Yeah. Whereas he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, notice those two words, the place. This is not just random here, the place. He said unto them, pray that ye enter not into temptation." He was about, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeling and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer he was, and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. For a few moments, I want to preach about this cup that Jesus drank in the garden of Gethsemane. 
The first thing I want to say about this cup, number one, I want us to think about the content of that cup. What was in that cup? What was so awful, so terrifying, yes, terrifying, that Jesus would literally shriek back and say, I don't want to drink that cup. What was so horrible? What was in Gethsemane's cup? Well, there's some answers that people give that are not right. First of all, people say, well, maybe it was physical death by crucifixion that caused such dread. Well, I would say that crucifixion was the most shameful, most hurtful, most painful form of death that had ever been created. No doubt about it. But let's just be honest. Others have died that way. And not only did others die by crucifixion, others gladly died that way. Thankful to be able to count worthy. Remember that? I mean, they were thankful to, to die for Jesus Christ. Martyrs have died this way, not with dread, but gladly dying for the Lord Jesus Christ. No, friend, it wasn't physical death that he shrank back from, not even the pain of crucifixion. Some say, well, perhaps it was some extraordinary attack of Satan that was in that cup. No, Jesus had already conquered Satan, hallelujah. Jesus had already met and conquered Satan. Yes, Satan is going to hound Jesus to the cross, but Jesus had no fear or dread of Satan. He said, now is the prince of this world cast out. Satan's no match for our God. But what was it that broke the heart of Jesus Christ? Was it the betrayal of Judas? Was it the failure of the disciples? Well, I, no doubt Jesus was disappointed. But there's a difference between disappointment and dread. This cup Jesus actually dreads to drink. What was in that cup? Two things I want to say this, evening, this morning. First of all, I'm going to say the pollution of sin was in that cup. You see, the Bible teaches us in Hebrews 4.15 that Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. But the Bible also tells us that in order for Jesus Christ to redeem us, our sin had to be placed upon him. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Do you know what was in that cup? The sin of the ages. My sin was in that cup. Can I just tell you this this morning? Brother Rick, I wouldn't want you to see my cup. I agree with one preacher who said this. He said, if you knew everything I've done, you wouldn't come hear me preach. He said, but if I knew what you did, I wouldn't let, let you come hear me preach. Amen. A lot of truth in that, isn't there? Yeah. Praise God for Calvary. That's, right. That's what we're preaching about today. friend, in that cup was not just my sin, your sin, Amen. everybody's sin, yep. all sin was in that cup, rape, murder, child molestation, blasphemy, witchcraft, child abuse. But at all, I mean, all, all sin, all people, all time, distill it into a cup and say, Jesus, drink this. Jesus became sin for us. He did not sin, amen, he never sinned. But he became sin for us and he took it to the cross. And Jesus knew that when he drank that cup, he would be numbered with the transgressors. We can't get our mind around that. But let me remind you today, Jesus is perfect holiness. Yeah, amen. And perfect holiness became sin. We can't understand those two extremes, can we? The perfect holiness of God on one side and him taking all sin on the other side. The pollution of sin is in that cup number two. I want to say the punishment of sin yeah. was in that cup. 
You see, Jesus knew the punishment of all sin and all people would be on him. You see, he not only died for that sin that he took, but listen, he died for all. I mean, think of that. Some people say, well, maybe the, maybe those who are in hell would begin to understand, well, they're only paying for their sin. And by the way, they'll never fully pay for their sin. That's why they'll be there for all of eternity. Jesus paid for all sin. He took the punishment for all. You see, that's why I'm not going to be punished. Because he took my punishment. But compound that and add yours and yours and yours and yours and yours and yours and everybody's. We can't get our mind around that, can we? Oh, love of God. How rich and pure. How measureless. Measureless. Can't get your mind around. Jesus bore it all. He knew that when he took this, that God the Father was going to have to treat him as if he was anybody else. And by the way, can I just say this? Those, the, the Bible says that he spared not his own son in Romans 8.32. You know, there are those who say, <laughs> yeah, me and God, we're going to work it out one day. Blasphemy! I'll tell you, listen, you listen to your pastor, you listen all this morning. Ever, there was ever a time when God the Father would have been tempted to be leaning on sin. It would have been on that day. Yeah. Not my day. Yeah. Or your day. Yeah. That's blasphemy. He spared not his own son. The Bible says, and it's hard to get your mind around these words. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord. Jesus took my sin and your sin and all sin. God the Father in justice had to treat him as if it was me or you. He received the thunderbolts of wrath that I deserve and you deserve. And we can't get our minds around it, but Jesus is the eternal Son of God who had been in the bosom of the Father from eternity past to eternity future would be separated from his Father on And again, you and I will never know the depths of the emotion for Jesus to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He had always been in perfect harmony with his father. He said, I do always those things that please him. What's the answer to that? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The answer is that God is of purer eyes than to be. God the Father had to turn his back on God the Son. You see, at the cross, all the worlds were distilled upon him. All the eternities were compressed on him. You say, well, how could Jesus pay all of that in that short amount of time? Well, you need to understand that Jesus being infinite paid in a finite period of time what you and I would have to pay in an infinite period of time. Because we're finite. Friend, Jesus suffered an eternity of hell on that cross. Jesus paid for all the sin, for all the people, for all the time. And that's why Jesus said when he saw that cup, Father, if it be possible, please let this cup pass from me. Number two this morning, I'm going to say not only the content of that cup, but number two this morning, may I speak to you quickly about the consumption of that cup. Because Jesus drank it all. And by the way, when I talk about Jesus shrinking back from wanting to do this, can I ask you a question? Does that make you think less of him? It makes me think more of him. Friend, don't you ever think that Jesus just kind of waltzed up to the cross? And this is some kind of charade. This is some kind of play acting. No, he, he did not want to do that. He's not play acting here. Listen, listen, he, he went through all this for us. This is real, friend. Makes me think more of him. That he did it anyways. 
We don't understand why he shrank back. We don't understand what was in that cup. In his humility, or excuse me, in his humanity and in his holiness, seeing the vileness of sin, he asked the Father if there be some other way. And silence from heaven said, there is no other way. So in his holy humanity, he shrunk back, but in his divine love, hallelujah, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine. And he paid a price that you and I will never comprehend. Let's remind ourselves this morning, he didn't have to die. He had a choice. Remember what he said? No man taketh my life from me. I lay it down on myself. You see, Jesus is the only one who ever chose to die. You see, the wages of sin is death. But Jesus didn't have to pay that because he'd never sinned. There's no death in him because he never died. He never, he wasn't a sinner. He didn't have to die. You say, well, someone who commits suicide chooses to die. No, they chose the time of their death, but they were going to die anyways. It's a point that a man wants to die. Jesus said, no man taketh my life from me. I lay it down on myself. Very interesting, isn't it? How Lucifer became the devil. How did he become the devil? Isaiah 14 when Lucifer said to God the Father, not thy will, mine be done. Mm -hmm. Five times in Isaiah 14, you find those two words, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. But Jesus, though he was God, a very God, said, not my will. Interesting contrast to think in your mind for a moment. Adam, following Satan in the Garden of Eden, said, Not thy will, my will be done. Where did he say that in a garden? Adam said to God, I know what your will is, but I want my will. Jesus, the second Adam, said in a garden, Not thy will, mine, not my will, thine be done. Adam said, Not thy will, mine be done. Jesus said, Not my will, thine be done. Both of them in a garden. Adam, when he said that, ruined the race. But Jesus, when he said that, <laughs> revived the race. Hallelujah. And redeemed the race. It's the consumption of that cup. And we need to see that Jesus willingly did this. He voluntarily did this. He vicariously, he victoriously said, not my will, but thine be done. Had Jesus said no, every one of us would be burning all of eternity. Understand that. Because Jesus suffered, bled, and died on that cross, we can be redeemed. Jesus took my sin, your sin, all sin to the cross. You see, God will never overlook sin. God is holy. He cannot overlook sin. By his holiness, he has sworn that sin must be punished. No sin goes unpunished. If God were to let one half of one sin go unpunished, God would no longer be holy. He would topple from his throne of holiness if he let one half of one sin go unpunished. You see, the cross is a way of God punishing sin and forgiving the sinner at the same time. That is by having the innocent sin bearer take the sin and carrying it to the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. In the end. There's another cup that we drink and we'll do this here in a couple of weeks. The Lord's Supper. By the way, don't you enjoy that cup? Amen. By the way, you know why tears flow from our eyes when we drink that cup? When we understand this cup. Just before Jesus went to Gethsemane, he said in Luke 22, he told his disciples in an upper room, this is the New Testament in my blood. Drink it. You see, because he drank the cup of sin, we can drink the cup of redemption. Amen. Hallelujah. Thirdly and finally this morning, may I speak to you quickly about the communion of that cup. I said the content of the cup, number two, the consumption of the cup, and number three this morning, the communion of that cup. Again, because God 
the son drank that cup, we can drink the cup of communion. You see, he took my sin, he drank it down. I take his righteousness, I take it in. Amen. I drink it in. God forbid that we would not be moved by Gethsemane. I want you to think of some words that the Bible uses here to describe what Jesus went through for us. He said at one place, he said, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. I want you to picture in your mind the Lord Jesus went through such excruciating difficulty during his time that literally his blood vessels burst. The Bible says that angels had to come and minister to him. He was God, listen, he was dying there in Gethsemane. Angels had to come and minister to him. He would have died in Gethsemane. Angels minister to him. And listen, when he's there in Gethsemane, and by the way, when, they, when Judas found him, oh, the hardness of men's hearts. When Judas finds him, his face is literally matted with blood and dirt. Many times when you study your Bible, you find Jesus praying standing. Other times you find Jesus uh, praying, lifting his face to pray. Other times he knelt on his knees to pray. But in Gethsemane, he fell on his face. When Judas would have laid that kiss of betrayal on Jesus' face, that face would have been matted with blood and dirt at the same time. And yet he betrayed him anyways. You would think, Brother Frank, that he would have had a little compassion to see him that way and say, you know what, I, I was going to do this, but boy, look what he's gone through. Oh, the hardness of men's hearts. His face is matted that way. His heart is broken. He said in one place here in this account, he said, my soul is exceeding heavy. The word heavy has the idea of being separated and being alone. And I remind you this morning that before those nails went through his hands, they'd already gone through his heart. Gethsemane was the best of you on Calvary. I realize that the price was paid on Calvary, but really the, the victory was won in Gethsemane. Because you don't have any Calvary without Jesus saying, Father, not my will, thy will be done. There's another word used in, this, in our account here, and it's the words exceeding sorrowful. This has the idea of being surrounded with no hope of escape, no way out, absolute suffering. Jesus paid that for us. And then in our text, it says it spoke, spoke of his agony. Agony. Do you know what the agon was in Bible times? The agon was an athletic contest. Luke, it was a wrestling match. It was a wrestling match. Jesus was wrestling. There's a contest here. So who's Jesus wrestling with? Is he wrestling with God the Father? No, never. He said, I do always those things that please the Father. Is he wrestling with Satan? Never needed to. He had absolute authority over Satan. So who's Jesus wrestling with? Answer, himself. Himself. There was his holy humanity and his divine love. It was a contest. There was that wrestling. And I'm glad love, hallelujah, paid the price. There's a story that goes back almost to the time of Christ, and I'm about done, but listen carefully. That Nero, who was the emperor of Rome many, many years ago, had men in his army, 40 men that were just absolutely chiseled. I mean, just men's men. They were gladiators. These 40 men would come to the Agon, the wrestling match. And they would wrestle for Nero. They wanted to please him. Nero, if you can picture this in your mind's eye, would, would sit in a luxury box with all of his royalty and he would watch these 40 men wrestle. They were the finest athletes in all of Rome. They would look up to Nero before they began to wrestle and here's what they would chant. We are 40 wrestlers. 
wrestling for thee, O Emperor, to win for thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. Everyone knew who these men were. They were the famous athletes of the day. They were the counterparts to our famous athletes today who were Olympic champions. Then word came to Nero that some of the people in his army had gotten saved, become Christians. Christianity is now beginning to spread and Nero wanted to so here's what he said. If I find a Christian, they'll be put to death. To be a Christian in these days is a crime worthy of death. You are either put to death by fire, by sword, or by beast. Nero sent out a word to his commander-in-chief. His name was Vespasian. He said, Vespasian, you go through the ranks. You go through the troops. And if you find any Christians, they will be killed. Vespasian lined up his troops, but what, he, what happened next, he was not ready for. Vespasian said, listen, Nero, our emperor, has spoken. If there are any Christians in our ranks, you must confess that you are a Christian, and you will be put to death. Vespasian said, I have been told that a Christian will never renounce his faith. So if you are a Christian, step forward now. Much to his surprise, every one of those 40 wrestlers stepped forward and said, we are Christians. Vespasian wasn't ready for that, so he, 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 he kind of taken it back. He said, listen, you, there must be some mistake. I said, step forward if you're a Christian. And every one of them to a man said, we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We are saved and we are Christians. Vespasian said, please step back. Think through what you were, listen, these are, these are, these are the best of the best. These are the best that, that Nero had. And he said, listen, step back, renounce your faith, I won't kill you, step back. Not one of them moved. Vespasian said, well, I can't put you to death with the sword, but here's what I will do. When I do this, he came up with a plan. He thought, this will keep them <clears throat> doing this, they will renounce their faith. So the story is told that Vespasian, and by the way, this was winter time. The temperatures were below zero. Vespasian built a huge bonfire on a frozen lake. He took those 40 wrestlers, stripped them down to completely nothing, and sent them out in the dark. And said, you men will go out. You can come back to the fire. Remember this below zero. If you will renounce your faith in Jesus Christ, you can come to the fire and be warmed. Vespasian thought this will work. They'll not be able to stand this. What happened next, Vespasian was not ready for. He heard a chant. A chant that he had heard before, but this time it was different. He heard these men chanting this. We are 40 wrestlers. Wrestling for thee, O Christ. To win for thee the victory. And from thee the victor's crown. Vespasian said, yeah, they'll do it now, but let them get good and cold. It's below zero. The story is told that as the night went on, the chant got quieter and quieter as these men literally were freezing to death. And finally, after many, many hours, one did come back. One slithered across the ice and Vespasian said, ha, I knew it. I knew these men wouldn't be able to stand this. Soon they'll all come. But he wasn't ready for what he was getting ready to hear. Because in a little while, he heard this chant. 39 wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, to win for thee the victory and from thee the victor's crown. 
was the account that I heard went like this. The best pace he took from his head. They have that on his head. Best pace he took off his shoes. Best pace he took off his coat. Best pace he took off everything that he wore. And marched towards those men. And said, 40 wrestlers wrestling for thee, O Christ, to win for thee the victory, and from thee the victor's crown. <coughs> I'm just here to tell you this morning, I'm glad Jesus wrestled for me. Amen. <coughs> Am I a soldier of the cross? I want to be. I'm preaching to somebody here this morning. You say, preacher, man, living for Jesus is hard. It's a struggle. It is a struggle. The world is a struggle. Our flesh is a big struggle, amen? It's a struggle. What keeps us going? I'll tell you what should keep us going. He wrestled for us. Amen? He wrestled for us. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. With every head bowed.